Okay, I'd like to introduce everyone. Uh, this is Ray, this is Chris, this is Liz, and this is Amy, and I'm uh, Ron Shane. What we're going to be doing today is uh, kind of using a little music, a uh, little movement to uh, try to uh, uplift the language that I've extracted from this 12 volume poem that I've put together, which is out right here. Uh, this poem is based on Milton's Paradise Lost, and it's basically trying to upgrade the human psyche for the modern world. Uh, some of the themes that uh, are operative in the Judeo-Christian uh, epistemology, uh, I feel are no longer operative in the world that we're living in. And what I've done is I've extracted from Taoism, uh, the pre-Socratic Greeks, uh, some of the Renaissance humanism, and elements out of uh, many primitive cultures to come up with a model for human consciousness, which I think would be a lot more Edenic, a lot more fascinating, and a lot more euphoric than what we're experiencing in today's consciousness. Uh, many of you, I don't know where you're coming from, but at least from what I can see, what we have in the mindset for today's mind really is not bringing us uh, a opulence of joy. In fact, it's uh, putting us in a position where we are somewhat uh, distraught and um, not actualizing the human potential to the degree that we're capable of experiencing. And what I'm trying to do in this particular work is to allow the inner uh, self, or what you might call what's inside of us under the guise of our exterior self, to manifest in a way that would be a lot more fascinating and we would live in a way where paradise and pleasure would be much more at our minds than some of the conscious suffering that we experience in the modern Judeo world. And I'm sure all of you are interested in cleansing your minds of uh, certain possibilities that keep us uh, hindered, impeded from uh, certain feelings. So the poetry that I'm going to be um, bringing forth here is actually about three or four pages from each of the 12 volumes. This poem is close to 800 pages. It's one of the longest poems that I know of uh, written in this hemisphere. And what the story is, is directly the same parallels Milton's, uh, Milton's Paradise Lost. For most of you who probably haven't heard of Paradise Lost, Paradise Lost is dealing with Genesis. It's the theme of the fall of one of the godheads and eventual uh, earthly fall of man. It's dealing with the Adam and Eve. And I use a completely different metaphor. Uh, in my story, instead of the normal godhead, I use Zeus. The fallen godhead is Saturn or Dionysus. Dionysus in the early Greeks was the god of vertical, etheric ecstasy. Most of the primitive cultures and some of the early Greeks were concerned with uh, states of rapture. I mean, they were not really interested in how to gain more money in their bank accounts, or uh, whether their uh, Ferrari went faster than someone else's. What they wanted to do was to uh, use the human life force in such a fashion that um, they would get the same level of pleasure that a large predator gets when it stalks its prey. And they would keep that state uh, at that optimal level for um, a few hours, you know, they would go into frenzy states. Now, our Western consciousness cannot understand that. I mean, you get rock stars like uh, Axl Rose, Jim Morrison, Jimi Hendrix that were using enough drugs to, uh, you know, turn their brains into serotonin rivers, you know, uh, and um, they were attempting to kind of intuitively uh, experience that landscape. 
um, which is a natural response. You know, if we all of a sudden removed our conscious minds, which is what the theme that I deal with here is the removal of the conscious mind. Now, we all think that what we contemplate, what we reflect upon each day, is really where it's happening. And it may be what's happening for you. However, there is a whole dimension, or many dimensions of self, that cannot be uh, experienced when you're thinking about your bills, you're thinking about your job, you're thinking about your kids, you're worried about uh, what's going to happen in the future, you're worried whether your wife is cheating on you, whether you're worried whether you're uh, looking good, you're worried about this, you're worried about that, you know, all these thoughts are, you know, constantly bombarding us. And what I'm dealing with in this book is what would it be like if we took that part of our intellect and melted it away, what sort of individuals would we be? What instincts would emerge and what would we feel when that uh, encountered? Many of you know how good it feels when you're at the apex of uh, sexuality and you're, you know, you're just going at it and you're on that rush, you're not thinking about anything more, you just want to climb higher and higher to the point of where you uh, feel free. You begin to feel that predator feeling, you know, that really strong animalistic feeling. You know, certain people experience that uh, when they, you know, paint or sometimes when they dance or sometimes if they're in martial arts when they break that board at the moment of impact, they feel that total expression of freedom. Um, and many primitives do that in their mythology and, and in their religions. In primitive cultures, religion is employing a form of mythology to dull the conscious mind to where the intuitive self is able to express a certain um, freedom and a certain liberation where when that is uh, finally uh, governing you, you feel such a primordial sense of pleasure that you can't believe how good you're feeling because you're not caught in this monolithic state that we call reality. I mean, it is something that's about as real as anything we want to fabricate, except we believe it to be real. We allow ourselves a certain vibration. Now, what Milton is dealing with, Milton is justifying this state. He is saying that the moment that we come into the flesh, we are sinners. We are wrong. We must uh, live a certain type of life to find uh, a type of inner, uh, kind of like an inner sense of uh, harmony. And so we're born in disharmony. Now, many of the primitive cultures and like Taoist religions, they take the point of view that we achieve a state of innocence and purity and beauty and perfection at the time that we're very young. But we uh, are inculcated into this particular culture and we you know, uh, get caught in this web of uh, chaos and confusion and uh, we believe what we're told. And this is what causes us to be disfigured on the inside. So, um, you know, I argue against that. I use uh, many of the thoughts of some of the tantric yoga themes, some of uh, Buddhism, Taoism, and uh, Renaissance humanism, uh, which borrowed greatly from the early Greeks, where they have a whole different picture. We are supposed to celebrate this earthly existence and try to achieve a natural sense of uh, paradise inside ourselves. So what I'll be reading here might not make as much sense to really understand the entire vision of what I'm doing with epistemology. And for those of you that don't know what that means, it means why we know what we know, our reality, what we think. You know, like if you sat down one day with some type of shaman from uh, some strange culture, they may have a different reality. They're going to think something different. If you go to uh, Thailand, or if you go to Bali, if you go to New Guinea, um, you go someplace in South America, they have a different reality. Their time is different. What they believe their gods are different. Their connection with the earth is different. Their connection with the stars are different. They feel a different reality. 
Now, we think our reality is the only reality, and it's probably not. There's other dimensions. And they feel things and know things that we don't understand, and they're feeling a sense of pleasure. Now, much of our action is based on a type of uh, pleasure. You know, we want to feel pleasure, but we, you know, you've read the books that come out showing that our materialism may not lead us to feel a sense of sublimity within ourselves. And we must look at other ways. And um, knowledge and self-exploration uh, might be a path in which you can uh, unfold certain possibilities. So um, I'm going to open up questions once we go through the text here. Uh, Amy's going to be working on a little bit, and I'll be working on, so you'll get a just position between uh, different energies in terms of this per performance. Any questions? Let's do it. Guys, are ready? Okay, so just, you know, you know my case. Amy's going to open up first. Take Thank you. 
consciousness. However, the noble rebel is an unfathomable dynamic beacon who transverses in his ineffable mystical sphere of wild, unencumbered exuberance. He delights in his clandestine wizardry and is an accomplished shaman, toast lunar witcher. And his rituals are actualized diurnally upon reverence Elysium altars. What's going on right now, the words may seem strange to you, what they're talking about. And what I'm dealing with is, what are we like when we are no longer consumed by common rationality? And we begin to understand some of the higher truths that are inside our mystic minds. And most of you may not know what that feels like, but it's very different. It's a form of... Understanding, which is very interesting, and when you unleash that part of yourself, the power you achieve and the energy that you begin to know is something very enthralling. And for the Western mind, they go, What the hell is that person talking about? Why would someone want to do that when I have my car, I have my stereo, I have my radio, I have my friends, I have 42 channels on my cable station. Why would I want to understand this? There's no reason to, I'm not bored. But for some people, they have a quest to experience depths which are quite unknown and quite impassioned to them. So that's what's going on so far. Mankind must rekindle his mental eminence, which is now like a spring whose pleasures have become arid and obscure. And he must devastate those configurations of thoughts that you absurd and steal away the heart's joyous, sacred splendor. The seething enchantment of the mind sorcery consumes the spirit of its lunar frenzy. And this is the quintessential arcane pleasure of the superior shamanistic renegades. However, they are assiduously bent on annihilating man's doleful, cursed of social reality. And this would engender man's nervonic psyche to be evocatively ecstatic. And its etheric, hedonistic wisdom would majestically flourish with enthralling magnificence. Thusly, man's divine sagaciousness must not be mortified nor impeded by his rancid, perceptual basement. The hearts of these renegades are not discordant nor esteemed by witless capricious feats, but rather are wildly valorous and passionately focused with a chivalrous, unbridled wrath upon Zeus and his earthly invidious cohorts. Okay, what's going on here is I'm talking about a sense of rebellion, a form of metaphysical rebellion. And um, for many people that that is completely out of their dimension of perception. And their corporal beauty is not tainted nor besmirched by man's vulgar psychological oppression. These rebels are imbued with seditious fire and desire to devastate modern man's tyrannous empire of covert psychic subjugation and horrid spiritual environment. These rebel warriors are pernaciously determined to deconstruct and thoroughly destroy society's mental emphasis of ludicrous distillation. And intellectual dominion of dismal trepidation. Dionysian metaphysics and Saturn's mystical epistemology shall again reign supreme within man's esoteric consciousness. And Zeus's execrable intradications shall be wondrously dissipated into imaginations of dark and oblivion. Man's fiendish mental pragmatism and his usurping analytical reason will be upended by the rebels' direful besiegement. The renegade army is wantonly coy, comprised of future tristers like the cunning god Hermes. In contrast, the society Diana, the titaness and ruler of the spirit's alchemical dominion, 
and the queen of sacred sorcery utilizes the masculine yang energy as the essential component in erotic mystical ceremony is a mysterious transformation. Her ascendant beauty exceeds Zeus's banal powers, and Vulcan, in obsequious orisons, surrenders his purest essence. To her enchanting marvel. Naturalistic physical energies, which the raw, pure pleasures of our corporeal bodies, through radical metamorphosis, they are altered into incorporeal substance and becomes the fundamental source which energizes and invigorates our higher sacred nomenon sphere. Thus the metaphysical mutability is the in inveterate and sagacious dynamics of our paganistic mystical consciousness. Vulcan comes upon the clandestine hovel, where a throng of dianic female huntresses are assembled. And they are engaged in ecstatic and meditative reverence to the leopard queen's enthralling, regal, ascendant, erotic, impassioned elegance. And Vulcan is attired like a cavalier from a Roman commander. Why are you profane temple harlots, not overwhelmed and delighted by my godly presence? You must be taught and conditioned to entertain me with sacratan of duty. We wait not your loathsome nature, and are offended by your foully decomposed spirit. Vulcan, your heart is infused not with amorous merriment, but inflicts a dirge of painful shame and direful petrobation in our petite soul. O oh, Zeus, your omnipotent father, kindle and cultivate guile, obstinate hate, and destructive wrath in man's benevolent psyche. You are terrified by my dank doom of unfaltering judgment, and I'll secretly recoil from the naked repugnance of my harrowing enmity. Your defiant arrogance shall be diminished and overcome by my divine majestic persona. Your antic of rejoicement and delight will be eclipsed by my terror. You vile, pernicious fiend, don't presume to resurrect yourself as our imperious judge, and we are not affected by your perjured quips of slander, nor your prescription of mystical constriction. You detest our luminous mystique and have attempted to thoroughly subdue our powers of alchemical metamorphosis. You are a traitorous, diabolical sorceress, and it is essential that your whimsical actions be curtailed and suspended of their ill. Moreover, your perfect behavior will be principled to stern obedience, and you imps should plead for mercy and servilely resign themselves to man's treacherous authority. Society's reality excels your rebellious indignation. You women should violently be coerced and succumb to masculine subjugation and rule. Women should only be erotic stimulators of adornment and enjoyment. as you are destined to be forever abashed and servile, be consumed in submission to man's pedestrian will. You women must be wretchedly grovel like mindless, malevolent serpents. You are spoilers and defamers of mankind's virtuous powers. Shamanistic females are charmers and evocative facilitators of static ascension. And your heinous edicts have deadened and usurped the exotic uses of our mystical ebullience. Your persuasive epistemology educates the human spirit to venerate scurrilous sorrow and hideous rueful dismay. Rather than experiencing the earthly sphere as a Saturnian celebration of resplendent pleasure, no longer we conceal an array of flindiferous marvelment of our etheric bodies, 
with your hideous cloak of fallacious squalid. Instead, our transcendent iridescent beauty shall with Elysian regalness illuminously enthrall all earthly hearts with mysterious delirium. We have forsaken your psychological interior manacles of upper diminution. And you should be better of our nirvanic fiery essence. Your wings of fear are not at our fleeted heels, and we can fly with you like the precious spirited Mercury.
finalized an uh, extended fervor in a erotic ritualistic play, which is a refreshing ceremony, which embodies wild carnal birth, with the electro, mystical, enchanted. And likewise, in the quick sense of dream, they deliciously dazzle each other with the Louis craft and wondrous psychic transformation of their Thank you. 
you are given to you that time to do that. So 
Uh, we're, you know, kind of wild animals. I mean, we have many of the characteristics of panthers or tigers, or, I mean, we, you know, this primordial part of us is very powerful. It's, but it's been so extracted by the ways of perception that we're told to be in. Uh, you know, many of us have lost contact with it. Uh, a couple of you are dancers, and I know that from your dancing, but also do it too, you know, you're able to make contact with the earth in such a way where, you know, you kind of feel that more primitive, centering way. And that's very powerful. And uh, people in martial arts also, you know, feel what it is when they, you know, get really into the ground and when they're feeling that power, it's very exhilarating. It's and if they take it further and further, as some of them have done, they begin to feel what the ancient uh, warriors felt. I mean, they were, I mean, the ancient warriors are very similar on the inside to some of the big cats. I mean, there's a lot of similarity, but we've lost these things. I mean, we, we've lost what this is like, you know? We've lost this adrenaline, exhilaration, that stimulates the deeper mystical components of the self. Yeah? Uh, um, I don't know if I'm to say that I think that it's very interesting. Just brought out and come back. You mentioned earlier to things like rock and roll and music. Yeah, well, rock and roll, which I've done a lot of. I've done over 120 you know, rock shows in my life. I've been doing it since I was a teenager, mostly punk. And, you know, you, you know, begin to sing lyrics and, uh, people here, some of them are working with me on a rock project, and you know what, like when you're doing it, you know, you've got that, you know, energy that's tribal, it creates so much more power, I mean, it just really creates a sense of power, and when you, you know, like, frame your lyrics, like, you know, I, I might have a, a lyric where rage would be up to the fury of the savage female, fiery leather, sucking blood of the tiger's lips, you know, with that heavy music, you know, it's it's not as complex as this. You just you, you get that power going, you get that energy going, you get that animalism, and then some of the more deeper or occult uh, feelings can emerge. Where pure poetry is very difficult. You know, I spent almost 14 years thinking about this project. I mean, this is like climbing Mount Everest or someone's mind. You know, you spent so many years in school studying, you know, because I've been studying on a regular basis since I was uh, 18. I mean, I've been doing it for a while, you know, and you have to do challenges. Like, the next work I'm going to be doing is even going to be more esoteric. It's going to be dealing with obvious metamorphosis, which is the cornerstone for Western mythology. I mean, it's, it's our mythology, and this mythology is used as ways to get deeper into the core of the interior. I mean, it's, the stuff is so, so complex and so difficult to work with, and I'm going to be restructuring it to come in with like a road, you know, going deeper into it, because I'm personally fascinated by the possibilities of what you can achieve on that uh, deeper mental plane, because you realize that the mental plane becomes the physical plane and there's no separation between them. They're exactly the same. One of the things that is taught in martial arts is that what breaks those boards, of course you have to have the physical element there, but what really has that shattering effect is where that whole mental is not only located right here, but it's located every part of you. Every part of you feels that mental. You watch those Bruce Lee movies, I mean, many of you have seen Enter the Dragon. And when he's breaking that board, I mean, he's putting that force all the way through him. So the same force that I use to write with, I can also use to break board with or use it for other things. Where you're using that same power and you begin to understand that you can do a lot of things with that. That the, the mind is not the words, it's an energy. And you can heat that energy up. And when you heat it up, you begin to understand different states of euphoria and different states of um, pleasure. It uh, becomes something quite interesting.
Well, thank you for sitting and listening to many words. You probably are going rather, uh, you know, a surfeit of words, which will probably last some of you for maybe five, six years. You've had so many words today, but I really appreciate it. You know, it's uh, and if you ever are interested, uh, you know, like you know me, and you know me, uh, like if you're interested in anything that I have written, I have written over. 80 different works right now on various esoteric subjects. Unfortunately, I don't write in a commercial way. I write about what I am fascinated with. Um, thanks. Any other questions or comments? Thanks a lot. in the last 250 years. Changes that are deeply connected to a series of interrelated values, systems, metaphysical ideas, scientific, philosophical outlooks, and so forth. Uh, what I'm driving at is the whole interlocking system of Western rationalism, Newtonian physics, logic, etc., capitalism, that is attended, in fact, and coextensive with the rise of capitalism and the Industrial Revolution, and its more recent uh, global manifestations in multinational corporations, and with the parallel and interrelated rise of military technologies and the inevitable use of these uh, military technologies with appalling and mind-boggling consequences, these changes began to emerge most noticeably near the end of the 18th century in the cataclysmic events surrounding the French Revolution and to a lesser degree the American Revolution Events which, in effect, sounded the end of the long-established European notions of culture, civilization, art, savagery, etc. Events which, among other things, forced a confrontation with the full implications of democracy. And some of these are implications that I don't think people... systems as they were rising in the West were reducing people to cognitive machines. They were emphasizing logic, rationality, certain types of conformity at the expense of what was most real about people. And what's most real about people, a lot of these artists felt, was their feelings, their emotions, their sexualities, their passions, even the ugly parts of these things. So in the last 200 years, there's a whole series of artists whose whole point was to confront audiences with the non-intellectual, non-rational, frequently even ugly, repellent, violent, disturbing aspects about themselves, things that are hope that are uh, the larger systems we're trying to squash. And this leads us right into what we're doing here today. All right. All right, simple enough. Lovers and madmen have such seething brains, such shaping fantasies, that apprehend more than cool reason can even comprehend. To open the eternal worlds, to open the immortal eye of man inwards into the worlds of thought, into eternity ever expanding imagination. Energy is eternal delight. Energy is the only life. 